Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we're going to be finishing up our look at arches. We're going to, in particular, to be discussing funicular arches, uh, learning what a funicular arch is. Well, namely, it's an arch that has uh, pure compression in all sections, and uh, more specifically, how to determine the maximum forces uh, with at various locations in such an arch, and also how to lay out the uh, the arch profile for a funicular arch that will carry all of its uh, vertical loads in a state of pure axial compression. So again, the topic for today is arches, and in particular, we are looking at funicular arches. A wonderful word, funicular. Um, Wonderful spelling, although it does have a more useful definition than it's perhaps its spelling. So a funicular arch is a particular type of arch, and this arch, uh, this arch's profile is special um, because it is very much the arch equivalent of a, uh, a cable, in the sense that a cable uh, is in pure tension, an ideal cable is in pure tension in at all sections. But a funicular arch is in pure compression at all sections. A funicular arch will have pure compression in all sections. In other words, it will carry no moment, no shear, etc. So if I have a arch like this, an arch shape, a crudely drawn arch shape at best, um, and then I look at the uh, forces that are present in this at any given location, there will be a compression vector at every point along that arch that is um, tangent to the curve of the arch itself at that location. So because of this, because you have this pure compression behavior, uh, we have the same relationship between uh, overall moment, um, between, I should say, uh, the height of the arch and the moments of the equivalent uh, uniformly supported uh, uniform, or I should say, a simply supported beam, and the horizontal thrust in the arch. In other words, what is special about a funicular arch is that this arch, this type of arch, uh, uh, follows the behavior of the cable equation. And we saw in previous lectures that the cable equation is that mz is equal to h times hz. And again, as a reminder, mz is the, uh, at some location in a beam or in a, um, on an arch or a cable, mz is the, uh, at that particular location, is the moment that would be generated by an equivalent um, simply supported beam. Um, by an equivalent simply supported beam. Or just a simple beam. H, and again, H is our horizontal thrust. And just like in cables, this horizontal thrust is going to be constant across the length of the arch. And HZ is going to be the, uh, well, when you're we talking about cables, we refer to it as cable drape um, or cable sag, but I could just call this the uh, height of the arch at some location. So H will be constant, again, as a reminder, H is going to be constant across the entire length, but MZ and HZ, these vary uh, with X. In other words, they vary across the length of the arch. Okay, so we are gonna see today that the, uh, we will see today that the, uh, this equation, just like it held true for cables, also holds true for funicular arches. And uh, not all arches, of course, are funicular arches. You have to design them in a certain way. Um, you have to design them for a particular profile if you want them to have this pure compression condition. And what's really special about this is, um, or what's really subtle about this, is that there's not necessarily one profile 
um, for all types of loading. Rather, for any given distribution of load, there will be a shape of arch that produces uh, a, a pure compression condition. So, in fact, I'll even write that out because I think that's really important. Again, uh, for, if it, for any given distribution of loading, so for a distribution of loading or a load distribution, if you go and apply the properties of the uh, moment diagram and uh, choose a maximum height of your uh, arch, etc., cetera, um, well, if you combine the load distribution with a uh, chosen max arch height, If you have these two things, uh, you can in turn uh, determine, again, if we're given the load distribution and the chosen max arch height, we can then find the uh, funicular arch profile. And by profile, I mean a, a, an equation or a plot of what the arch should, uh, arch's profile should be um, for a given height as a function of x uh, of the arch um, as you go along um, the x-axis. So again, if you know the load distribution and you have a, uh, a chosen maximum height or the height at some location, uh, you can then uh, map that to a single funicular arch profile. And no matter where you cut that arch, um, and what, if you take a section here or here or here or here, no matter where you take a section in that arch, you will have pure compression at that location. In other words, your uh, only internal force will be compression, and that force vector will always line up uh, or be tangent to the curve of, that, of the arch at that location. And so we're going to look at a couple examples of how we actually go and do that, how we actually determine the arch profile for a given uh, type of loading. And the key thing to keep in mind is that it is different for every type of load distribution. So a, uh, so if you have a, uh, let's say a system where there is a, a single point load, well then you're going to have one type of uh, funicular arch. If you have, say, two point loads at third spans, then you'll have another type, uh, another profile that is most ideal. And if you have a uniform load, you'll have yet another profile um, that, is, uh, that is necessary to produce a true funicular arch. So again, for a given load distribution and a given uh, chosen maximum arch height, there is a single arch profile uh, that will meet those conditions. Okay, and let's take a look at a few examples. I wanna look at one case of a, uh, a few point loads on an arch and also I want to consider a few cases of, uh, or one case of a uniform distributed load. So let's clear some room and we'll go ahead and get started on that. So really the key takeaway for today is that for any given uh, load distribution, there is a, again, a single arch profile that will, uh, allow one to have a funicular arch condition or a pure compression condition at all points in that arch. And uh, the only thing that you have to choose then on top of the load distribution is the um, whatever max height you are designing for. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. So uh, let's say we have uh, this example here. So for example one, I want to uh, look at a, um, a system where I need that if I were trying to support the, uh, basically I have, um, so let's look at this here. Imagine I have a, uh, a couple loads over a span that I need to support. And let's say that if I supported this as a beam, the equivalent simple beam would look like this. I would have uh, two 10 kip loads at the third points on the span. 
and dimensions this is 20 feet 20 feet and 20 feet so again this is the uh this is what the uh if i were supporting these loads by a beam this is what this would look like but instead i want to uh design an arch to carry these loads and in particular design a funicular arch one that will be in pure compression uh, so design a funicular arch to carry these loads. And let's say we have a max height um, and then design with a max height of 25 feet. So I want to design this with a maximum height of 25 feet. So again, I have, uh, I need to support a 10 kip load, 20, ki uh, 20 feet from the left-hand side, and another uh, 20 feet from the right-hand side of this span. And then I just want to uh, produce an arch that has a maximum height of 25 feet. So just like we did with cables, the first step for this is going to be to analyze our equivalent, uh, our equivalent simply supported beam. And so if we consider the reactions on this, well, I must have a 10 kip and a 10 kip reaction force here. And then if I were to draw the shear diagram, let's see the shear diagram. If I can manage to draw a straight line. Let me fix that. That helps if I draw a straight line. So let's say I have a moment di a shear diagram like this. Um, the shear diagram we're going to uh, pop up from the from the reaction on the left hand side, be constant, then uh, then drop down to zero, be zero for a while, and then we'll drop down um, at the uh, left or, or the right hand load. So we'll have a shear of ten kips, zero and ten kips, at lengths of twenty feet. 20 feet and 20 feet. Or the moment diagram would be fairly straightforward. It would just be the area of this is 200, so we would be up here at 200 uh, kit feet. We would be constant for a while and then we would drop down again to, to, uh, to zero. So um, we know that the, uh, just like it was in the case of uh, cables, I know that my y as a function of x, my actual arch profile, should be proportional to my moment as a function of x. So I can use this as a guide to actually laying out my funicular arch. And so let's go ahead and do that. I'll clear this and then we'll finish this one up. Again, um, because arches and just like cables have a single horizontal thrust in them at all points, the uh, horizontal thrust essentially serves as a scale factor between the moment diagram or the moment equation and the actual uh, geometric arch profile. So knowing that we can then go and uh, find our arch profile. And again, we know that it's going to be proportional um, to our moment diagram, so we can actually use that as a guide to laying out our um, arch profile. And I know this is going to be a bit of an unusual arch because it's going to be uh, composed of straight lines. And that's not something you're used to seeing with an arch. But again, um, an arch has a different definition. Uh, structurally, an arch has a slightly different definition than what you might consider an arch in everyday parlance. From the structural analysis point of view, an arch is just a shape that carries vertical loads uh, largely or purely in tension, or sorry, in compression. And so um, if, you have a, a sh uh, if you have a very simple loading where you just have a couple point loads like this, you, can, you might end up with an arch shape. The ideal arch shape would be something like this. So our arch profile uh, then would be something of the same shape, like this. And since we actually know, we were actually given 
uh, as a design variable that the uh, maximum height is 25 feet, we then know that the maximum height on this arch is 25 feet. And if you want to know the dimensions, well, it's going to be exactly the same as the moment diagram. 20 feet, 20 feet, 20 feet, and 20 feet. And this essentially is the solution to the problem. This is the arch profile. We have a relationship between the height of the arch. Uh, we basically have y as a function of x um, laid out graphically here. Okay, um, and again, um, if we want to actually uh, find the horizontal thrust, that's not going to be too bad, because we can again say that uh, mz is equal to, uh, mz then is equal to, uh, let's see, that is h, hz. And again, hz and mz will vary across the, uh, across the uh, will vary as a function of x, while the horizontal thrust will be constant at all points. So h is going to be equal to mz over hz, and we could just use the mid-span values here. The maximum moment is 200 kip feet, and then uh, the maximum height is 25 feet. And so we can determine that the maximum, uh, or the not the maximum, just the horizontal thrust, is 8 kips. So there will be a, a single horizontal thrust at all locations, and that is 8 kips. Now, um, again, what will happen, though, is that the uh, while, while the horizontal thrust will be constant, the actual uh, compressive force in the, uh, uh, in the arch will not be constant. Rather, it will vary as a function of the slope. With the steeper the uh, arch, at the, the steeper the arch's profile at a given location, the higher the overall tensile force, or sorry, the overall compressive force. Because again, if you recall from cables, we have our overall force, and then we have the h. Um, we have our horizontal thrust h uh, constant throughout, only varying with the uh, with the uh, slope. And if the slope is theta, then um, again you would have uh, cosine theta equals h over f, or f equals h over cosine theta. And so the larger our theta, then the larger the uh, f has to be to actually have that horizontal component equal to our uh, single horizontal thrust. Okay, so that was a relatively simple loading. And next I'd like to consider a, uh, a uniform loading. Uh, questions on this so far? Okay. So I next want to look at the case of a uh, uniform load, and uh, I want to see what kind of arch profile will be necessary to carry a, uh, a uniform load in a funicular arch condition. So let's go ahead and do that. And again, what I'm illustrating today is the idea that uh, for any given load distribution, there is going to be uh, really one uh, arch shape that will carry all of the loads, well, that will carry those loads in a pure compression arrangement. Or in other words, there is one single funicular arch profile, although that uh, does have a scale factor associated with it, which is whatever uh, maximum height you choose, or a given, et cetera. Or you just have space for it. Okay, so let's take a look. So let's for a moment say we have a simply supported beam. So I have a simply supported beam and it carries a distributed load W. Not even gonna have, this is more of a derivation than a specific problem. Um, but let's say we have a distributed load W and uh, then we, of course, know that there's going to be reactions of W, oh, and I'm going to define its length as L. And then we'd have reactions WL over 2 and WL over 2. So I need, in other words, I want to design a, uh, a funicular arch to carry the same, to carry a uniform load. And this is what the equivalent uh, simply supported beam would look like. 
And uh, I'm going to say that this arch, uh, this arch must span, or must, first let's say it must carry W, the distributed load W, um, have length L. Um, I want it to have a length of L, and uh, let's give it a maximum height of H. And a maximum height of H. And I want to figure out what arch profile is necessary to do that. Um, find or derive uh, a funicular arch profile for this loading. So let's go ahead and do that. And again, the key takeaway here today is that for any given, uh, for, for any input load, uh, for any input load distribution, there will be a single funicular arch uh, profile that will produce this ideal pure compression condition. And the reason I, again, the reason I keep coming back to this pure compression condition is that this, at least for an arch, is the most efficient uh, structural form. You don't have any moments, you don't have any shear, and so uh, for a pure, a pure compression or a pure tensile condition does result in very efficient uh, structural forms, very similar to how trusses are, um, have all of their elements in pure compression or, comp or pure tension. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Now, um, we have this load profile on our equivalent simply supported beam, and we would in turn have a shear diagram that looked like this. We would pop up at the right support or at the left support to WL over 2. Then we would linearly decrease to negative WL over 2. We will linearly drop from one side to the other. Then our moment, well, this will be parabolic, and it would be uh, the area of this section, because this is L over 2 here, um, that would simply, the area of this um, would then be our, uh, well, let's see, it's 1 half base times height, so that would be WL squared over 8. And that shouldn't be surprising, as the moment in a simply supported beam, the maximum moment, is famously WL squared over 8. So, what I next want to do is uh, turn this into an equation that we can then work with algebraically. So um, I could do this a few ways, although I think on this one I'm going to use a interesting coordinate system, uh, a coordinate system that makes this a little bit easier uh, to work with. Okay, so um, let's go and uh, say that the coordinate system I'm going to use, um, I'm going to define my mid-span as zero. So if uh, midspan is x equals zero. If we set the midspan to x equals zero, then we can have the following relationships or the following known points. If we set the, uh, again, the midspan as x equals zero, uh, I have some known moment points, and those would be uh, at negative L over two, I would be at zero moment at the left hand side. Um, at midspan, or x equals 0, I would be at WL squared over 8. And at the right side, or L over 2, positive L over 2, uh, I would be at uh, 0 as well. So um, I know that uh, W as a function of x is just going to be uh, W. We have a constant load all the way across the section. Um, we know that shear is equal to the negative integral of v as a, of w as a function of x. dx, going back to our shear moment equations, or this would then be equal to uh, negative wx, uh, plus c, of course. And we also know that the shear, we, if we want a boundary condition for this, we can say that shear at x equals 0 is equal to 0. Again, I'm using this point here, my midspan, as my uh, zero point on my axis, on my x-axis. 
So I know that v at x equals 0 is 0. So that means that this c is equal to 0 here. So I know then that my shear as a function of x is simply negative wx. So, and, and that makes sense. When I, put in L, uh, when I put in negative L over 2 to this, I get a shear of positive W L over 2. And when I put in an X value of positive L over 2, I get a shear of negative uh, W L over 2. Okay. Then I can get the uh, moment as a function of X. And the moment as a function of X is just, of course, equal to the integral of shear as a function of X. Uh, dx, and that's going to come to uh, negative wx squared over 2 plus c, over 2 plus c, and I do need a boundary condition, and that is, and I can use as a boundary condition that my moment at x equals 0 has to be equal to wl squared over 8. Again, I'm defining uh, my center span as the zero x coordinate. So let's keep working through this and we'll get an arch profile. So uh, again, if I want to get a arch profile, an arch profile, I first need to get an equation for moment as a function of x, because uh, I know that uh, by r, if I want a funicular arch condition, then my uh, arch will must support the uh, must be compatible with my cable equation or my arch equation. Um, so my profile must be proportional to that moment, uh, that moment profile. So if I want the actual geometric profile of the arch, I need to have the uh, I need to have a, mo a relationship between moment as a function of x. I need to know the moment as a function of x for that arch. Okay, so let's go ahead and get that then, applying that boundary condition. And if I apply that boundary condition with here, I can conclude that c, just our const this constant here. Um, must be equal to WL squared over 8. Nothing uh, very revelatory there. So M as a function of X then, the moment in the, uh, in our, again, this is the moment in the equivalent simply supported beam, um, must follow the equation negative WX squared um, over 2 plus WL squared over 8. All right. Now, um, at this point, I'm going to define a new term. I will define a term, uh, what I call m naught, And m naught is simply going to be the maximum moment at any point in the beam, uh, in the equivalent beam. And that's just WL squared over 8. Um, or, in other words, I could also say that uh, W over 8, I'm going to say that W over 8 is equal to m naught over L squared. W over 8 is equal to m naught over L squared. So I'm then going to substitute this, uh, this expression into here and see what I can determine. So I will then have, uh, if I do that, I can get that, uh, let's see, I'll get that, um, um, I will get that m as a function of x is equal to m naught, if I do a little factoring, m naught over L squared times the quantity negative 4x squared plus L squared. Again, I, uh, I'm using the knowledge that I just uh, well, I chose the definition of m naught equal to the maximum, I just defined m naught as a constant for the maximum moment at the peak of the, uh, of the moment curve. And we know that's equal to W L squared over 8. And so when I, if I know that W over 8 is equal, then in turn I would know that W over 8 is equal to M naught over L squared via a little algebra. And so this would be basically M naught over L squared um, uh, here if I factor out an L squared. 
And uh, knowing that, I can then get, uh, I can then apply a little factoring and get this MOS function of x equals m naught over l squared times negative 4x squared plus l squared. Okay, so there's that. Now, at all points, I know that my, um, I know that my uh, cable equation must be satisfied. I know that this must be true at all points. Mz is equal to h, our horizontal thrust, times hz. Mz equals h times hz. Um, and mz, and again, mz and hz will vary as functions of x. So another way to think of this is that this is my m as a function of x. h is my constant, my constant of proportionality. And hc is simply my y as a function of x. That is the actual height profile of the, uh, of the arch as a function of x as we go along. So if I use this, I can then um, actually start getting a profile rather than just a moment equation. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's actually get the uh, profile of this arch. And again, we're going to start with this. Uh, we're going to start with this knowledge that m as a function of x is equal to h, our horizontal thrust, times y as a function of x. So let's go ahead and get that. Um, or another way of writing that over that equation there is that um, h. Uh, let's see. Is again knowing that m of x m as a function of x is equal to h times y as a function of x. Um, I know that y of x, which is what we're actually looking for in this problem, y of x equals m of x over h. And again, uh, uh, as or, or actually uh, capital, uh, capital H, sorry about that. We do have two h's in this. Capital H is the thrust in our arch and a single lowercase h will be the maximum height of the arch. Okay, so we know this, that we have uh, y as a function of x is equal to m as a function of x over h, and I know m as a function of x is equal to this, so therefore y as a function of x is equal to m naught over l squared divided by h, m naught over l squared uh, h, capital H, if I simply, subs all I'm doing is just essentially dividing this equation by h here. So then I'll have negative 4x squared plus l squared, like so. Now, I want to do a little work on these constants. And what I can set into, uh, I want to phrase these a little bit differently. And so what I'd really like to do is to get rid of this h here, the capital H. And because I want something that's just a pure arch profile rather than I, I'm, I'm uh, if I'm trying to find just the arch profile, I just want the geometry. I don't necessarily want the internal forces uh, uh, in the equation describing that profile. So I know at uh, I have one other piece of information that is at x equals zero. Again, we're defining zero as the mid span at x equals zero. I know that uh, y is a function of x is equal to uh, m uh, is equal to our lowercase h and again that lowercase h was provided to us at the beginning that is uh, we are designing and we're trying to design an arch that has a maximum height of h and a span of l like so okay so if i do that i can then um i'll put in h for y of x h equals uh, m naught uh, over, uh, let's see, m naught over uh, here. 
uh, let's see, yes, uh, times negative 4 times 0 squared. Again, I'm just putting in 0 for x and h uh, uh, for y, um, plus l squared, and all of this divided by l squared h. That term, of course, goes away, and uh, I am left with h equals, well, I'm left here with just l squared, so, uh, so l squared over l squared is just 1, so h is equal to m naught over capital H. Or what I really want to get is an expression to eliminate my m naught, and that is that my m naught is equal to lowercase h times capital H. So if I then do this, I can work, I can get the final form of my arch, uh, of my arch profile equation, which is as follows. So we're almost there, we just need to get our final arch profile equation. Okay. Um, so we have this, and now all I'm going to do is substitute, uh, um, I know that m0 equals lowercase h times h, so I'm going to substitute this into this expression. And so then if I do that, I can conclude that y as a function of x is equal to h times uh, negative 4x squared plus L squared divided by L squared. Um, in a case that's a little difficult to read, let me just say this is, let me write this here, y equals uh, h, again, h over L squared times L squared minus 4x squared. This is another way of writing this. And the book does have this slightly differently. Um, what the book has is a, the form like this. They have, um, again, Leet has, uh, in the text you'll find, uh, you'll find the form uh, y of x equals 4hx squared over l squared. But what they're doing in that equation is they are, uh, defining y is downward here, and also defining uh, our zero point on the x at midspan. But these two equations are equivalent. Um, the only difference is that theirs is, uh, uses a downward pointing y at midspan. However, I think it might also be useful to uh, get, this with the, get this equation with the uh, x and y uh, axes with the origin positioned right at the left, bottom left of the arch. Let's go ahead and do that. So I want to go ahead and do that. So uh, if I want to get this equation um, as a, uh, if I want to get this equation as a height profile as a function of x, but with the uh, x put down here, uh, the uh, x not position or the origin position down at the left uh, side of the arch, then what essentially what I need to do is apply a function transformation. And uh, to do that, I would uh, start with my uh, original equation, y of x equals h over L squared times L squared minus 4x squared. And I would transform this by essentially shifting it L over 2 units to the right. And if you recall back from your pre-cal days, 
Um, if you ship, if you want to transform or translate an equation uh, a certain number of units to the right, you replace the x with uh, x minus that translation. So h minus l squared times l squared minus 4 times x minus l over 2. And again, what I'm trying to do here is uh, I'm shifting it l over 2 units to the right because I want to see what this looks like with the... Uh, uh, with the origin positioned at the uh, bottom left of the arch. And if you expand that and work through it, you will get that y as a function of x is equal to h over l squared um, times uh, 4lx minus 4x squared. And again, this is the same equation, just with the origin uh, positioned at the bottom left. So the origin right here. with the origin at uh, bottom left, or at arch's left side. At the left support of the arch. Okay. So, any questions on that? I know that was a quite a lot. I was trying to get through this derivation fairly quickly, but um, let's review, let's uh, unpack this a bit again and see um, how we can actually use this piece of information. Okay. So let's take a look. And, or particularly, or in particular, what if I want to know not just the height of the arch as a function of x, I want to know um, the force within it. How can I do that? For example, let's maybe even use this uh, arch here. All right, so um, the key thing to keep in mind is, again, that you have a, um, a constant horizontal thrust at all locations in, um, in an arch, or at least a funicular arch. And so H is constant at all sections. H is constant, or capital H, or horizontal thrust. And um, so if we want to, uh, if we want to find our... Uh, the actual force, not just the horizontal thrust, but the actual axial force at some location in the truss. I would need to go and um, I need to, what I really need to know is a slope so, or an angle so I can determine the, uh, the relationship between the internal axial force and the uh, horizontal thrust. And to do that, you simply take the derivative uh, of our height profile with a function of, with it as a function of x. And so what would that be? Let's see, that would be h over l squared times 4l minus, well, that's just 8x. And I now have my derivative or my slope as a function of x. So again, h over l squared times um, or, uh, L squared minus 4, uh, 4LX minus 4X squared. And again, if I take the derivative of that, I get, uh, I will get my constant remains out front, H over L squared, 4L, and then minus 8X. So then if I want to know the, uh, the slope at any location, so for example, um, in this particular arch, let's say I wanted to know the, uh, the slope at the location where X, uh, where the slope, where the, um, where, where the force is maximum. And just like with cables, I know the steeper the slope, a steeper slope must lead to a higher internal force because our the horizontal component of that force is constant. And because uh, we have a parabolic profile in this case, I can say that the uh, that that has to be at x equals zero because I remember I moved this, I translated this so that x for this is right at the, uh, the origin for x is right at the left support. So I can just substitute zero in for this. So dy dx at zero, 
um, is HL squared, and uh, that term will go away, and just times uh, 4L, or simply uh, 4H over L. So if I wanted to then find the tension, or not the tension, the axial force uh, right at the mac at the uh, at its peak location, in other words, right at the uh, bottom of the arch at its uh, support, I could then say that because the slope is equal to this, well, I can create a little triangle, dy dx. I know uh, dy dx is equal to 4h over l, which means I have this relationship here, 4h over l. And I know uh, whatever my axial force, let's call that C, is, um, I must have a horizontal component of H. So I could get this as, let's see, that would be L by Pythagorean theorem, L squared plus 16H squared. So then I could simply apply similar triangles and say C over H is equal to, um, that would be root L squared plus 16H squared. Uh, over L, or simply C equals C over L times the square root of L squared plus 16 H squared, like so. And again, I could then substitute in the values for my geometry, and I could in turn calculate uh, the maximum compressive force at that location. So. Again, what we've seen today is that the general process of, um, is that for a funicular arch, uh, a funicular arch by definition is one that has constant compression in all sections, or in all sections. And if I want to find uh, the, the actual profile of that arch, I can um, take the, uh, I can first find the shared moment diagrams, look at the moment diagram, and then map that using a, a few constants of proportionality, namely uh, your horizontal thrust, and your predefined L and H. And then uh, using that, I can then calculate the arch profile. And if I wish to find the maximum force, I just need to find the location of maximum slope and then apply a little trigonometry to find the maximum compressive force. All right, any questions on any of this? Uh-huh. Oh. Yes, thank you. That is a little typo there. I just had that to see if you were paying attention. Yeah, that's what that was. <laughs> anyway, oh, yes? Of course. Okay. Ah, okay, the question is, what is M not? If you have your moment curve, moment as a function of X, right? Well, M naught was simply the peak value of that curve. I was just trying to express the peak, mo the moment as a function of X um, using M naught as a, uh, using M naught as a, a constant that I can manipulate algebraically. Does that kind of make sense? All it is is just, uh, it equals WL squared over eight, but all it is is just the value for the maximum moment at the peak. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? All right, well, if there are none, I think I'll go ahead and let you go. I uh, hope we found this a little bit. All right, that'll do it for today. Uh, hopefully you found this a little bit uh, enjoyable or at least a little informative on the uh, topic of the design uh, and uh, analysis of funicular arches. Again, the key takeaways for today are that funicular arches uh, have a single uh, uh, horizontal thrust throughout them, and they carry all of their uh, loads in pure axial compression. They are very much the uh, arch equivalent of a, uh, a drooping cable uh, that carries all of its, uh, or an ideal cable that carries all of its loads in pure tension. Uh, again, hopefully you found this enjoyable, at least a bit informative. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. And uh, in the next lectures, we'll be looking at the deformation of trusses. So I look forward to seeing y'all then. Hope you found this all enjoyable. Uh, look forward to seeing y'all soon. And as always, thank you.